Good job. Don't touch the camera, Olivia. Look through the, the thing and am I in focus? Ew. <clears throat> like the picture part or the video part? Just look through the screen. Am I in the shot? You're both in the shot. Okay. My mom was blended in. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Is the microphone on? <laughs> Jehovah is a, can you hear it? My withdrawals burn out like a skillet. Can you feel it? I'm all messed up, I admit it. We don't do this no more. We don't act right. We don't exercise. We do what we do. And who are you talking to? I'm talking to my flesh. Getting it under subjection? <laughs> Word. Try to give me a little headache by growing a tumor. Ain't no more tumors on me. It's your last one. Next time you go to tumor, I'm putting you out. <laughs> Technology should move around where you can get a new body. Trash in my brain. <laughs> yeah, that flesh, I'm transferring. What they call it, transferring your consciousness. Renewing of the mind. Renewing of the mind. Woo! Preach, Bill. Why are you quoting me walking? They tried to keep her brother down, but you can't hold me, gang member. <laughs> Only because you got them narcotics flowing through. That's a fact. Willin' Willie Lynch theory skips, but the microphone chips got us programmed to the tricks, huh? Devil got us programmed to them flicks, huh? See men from the head to the wrist and the government's primary focus is the bricks, huh? Celebrities, what you tell <laughs> Say hi to Poppy, Olivia. Oh. You look scared. Watch out. Give it softly. I love you. Well, at least she got a kiss. You will be great one day. <laughs> Envy, screw a hook, nail a TKO. In the hood, giving Christ dealers, giving out O's. Pimp selling sex pros, giving out blows. My simplest flows will eliminate foes. No, just glad that you're walking. Federate rose, whippings and beatings, he died for his woes. Tell him. You're a grown woman who likes sprinkles in her cookies. You're grown. That's correct. I do. I love sprinkles in my cookies. I also love glitter. <laughs> For sure. Um, today, I had to leave church. Uh, I, I got the opportunity to teach Sunday school. And it was already planned I was going to leave church early. But it's because it's a continuation of the treatment I've been going through. Um, I've been feeling pretty bad throughout the whole week. It's, it's, it sucks continuously having to feel nauseous and feeling drained and then being around a group of people which um, according to my treatment I have to limit that because of my cells and my um, my mm -hmm. ability to Your fight immunity. Effect, my immunity mm -hmm. so I have to limit how much exposure I have around people so today I came home early um, got in a bed and just waited till you all came home um, Jasmine said unicorns love glitter <laughs> We're one of a kind. <laughs> what up, G? Uh, um, so I, I'm going through treatment. Long story short, I want to kind of quickly recap. Some of you all don't know my, my story um, about how I end up with the diagnosis with stage three cancer. You know the technical term? Uh, colon rectal adenocarcinoma. I, I lean on Bell to give me the all that. All I just say stage three, got it. And so that's what I was diagnosed with. Initially, in my experience, I have been having symptoms for years. Um, mm -hmm. It started out with blood in my stool. Every time I go to the bathroom, uh, there'll be linings of of blood, whether it's bright red or dark red. Which, if you don't know, can you explain the difference? Like whether what what color of the red? What does that mean? Um, I guess if it's newer, older, or more superficial, more internal. Right. Um, as far as the blood, but I mean it depends too where you're bleeding from. So that's and that and that's what the doctors were saying. So I'm telling them I got blood in my stool and that it was bright red, and so they were saying, 
oh, it's because you're straining on the toilet, um, you're constipated because you got diabetes, your sugar's uncontrolled. Everything was diabetes, according to them. According to the doctors, all my symptoms was diabetes, diabetes related. So uh, they gave me stool softeners and stuff like that, but I was still having blood in my stool. And then I went through a period earlier this year where I would have diarrhea four or five times a day, just randomly out of the blue. And, I, and I'm on a truck going through all this. And y'all know you're on a truck and you're going down the road and there's no access to bathrooms. It's, you know, it gets kind of crucial, but it would just come on me all of a sudden. And I went through that for a whole month and then that just completely stopped out of nowhere. So it was really my bathroom behavior that really kind of like, that was the initial, what's wrong with me? And then it got to the point where I started cramping every day. Every, it started just in the mornings. I would get cramps, you know, and my stomach would be turning. And Belle would ask me, she's like, you all right? You good? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I'll go to work do it throughout the day, and then I'll get cramps in the evening. And it became routine. It became part of my normal. I didn't question it. And then stronger and stronger to the point he couldn't even speak when he was going through a cramp belt. Yeah, yeah. I had um, the cramping just kept increasing, increasing in strength. And by the time where I got to the point where I couldn't talk, I was like, well, let's, I need to go to the doctor. Mind you, this has been going on for an extended amount of time. I've already been to the doctor twice. I've been to the urgent care a few times. Urgent care gave me some anti-cramping medicine. Um, they even, <laughs> the doctor at the urgent care, she didn't recognize me. I went to go see her twice. First time I went to go see her and told her I had blood in my stool. She was like, you know what I gotta do, right? Around the world swirl. And I told Bill that it was almost like, you know, the Catholics does the in the name of the Father, Son. She North, did that. South, east and west. <laughs> she stuck her fingers in my behind and hit all the walls and swirled and you know what I'm saying and pulled stuff out and looked at the feces and was like, yo, it's the it's the right color and you know, she said everything was healthy. Um and I only can laugh at it now because it was very embarrassing. But I see how necessary it is, especially as black men, we, we need to get checked and make sure that we get second opinions when everything you feel. Nobody can tell you about your health outside of you. So she said I was good and she gave me some anti-cramping medicine, even gave me some type of uh, pain medicine to kind of get through. And I was still having problems. So I go back to my primary doctor. I said I need to get a colonoscopy and uh, what's the topic? Endoscopy. An endosco endoscopy, endoscopy, whatever, however you say that. What's up, Veronica? That's uh, Reggie's sister. What up, lady? So, yeah. So, um, I went, got a colonoscopy done, got an endoscopy done, and they put me under, and they couldn't complete the colonoscopy because I apparently had a tumor that was too, too large. Because of the staging and where I was at, uh, I was recommended to have surgery immediately or as, as soon as possible. So we, we went through the process of getting the consultation, having a surgeon. Um, shout out to Womack, uh, Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry. He was really, really professional. He was really, really dope. And Dara, y'all are the best. And his nurse, Dara. Uh, she, nurse Dara, she, they were so compassionate. It's funny when you get the type of care, you're not expecting people to treat you like a car or a, or a piece of machine. Because I'm truly in the dark. I don't know how serious the situation is. Matter of fact, at the time, I didn't even know it was stage three. We just knew that I needed surgery. And the way that they explained things to us, the way they were compassionate, they took their time. Because y'all know Belle will ask a thousand three questions because she wants the total understanding of what it is I'm dealing with. For me, it's just, just to take it out and we'll just d deal with it. And I think that was a good thing on his part, being naive and not understanding some of the things. For me, when I saw the photos, I'm not new to medicine. Um, I had a good understanding kind of where he was at. Um, but him being naive in that part actually, I think, kind of helped a lot. So, yeah. I was just ready to be pain-free. I didn't, you know, yeah. call it whatever you want to call it. And having the, uh, a cancer diagnosis didn't scare me. It still doesn't scare me. I, I rather know what we're dealing with up front so that we can pray and react to it versus um, staying in the background. And it's nothing it's nothing worse than being in the dark when there's something going on in your body. So either way, so boom, when you have cancer, depending on where you're at, you get a, a initial consultation, you get surgery, which um, that's what ended up happening to me. I came out of surgery 
I went to surgery on a Friday, came out on a Saturday, and um, I had the support. My wife was there the whole time. Um, Sister Fallen was there the whole time, and Belle's dad was there the whole time. <laughs> they literally waited. I was in surgery for six hours. Yeah. I was in surgery for six hours, and they stood there in, in the hospital the whole time until I came out. And when I came out, apparently I was under the influence, and they decided to record me, and my daughter came up to me, and I said, um, Child of my loins. <laughs> He said a whole lot more he don't remember. Hey, listen, I don't got to be under the influence to say stupid stuff. That's just what I do. You know what I mean? And uh, But it, it was it was very rewarding to have... It was rewarding to have her there alone. I, that's all I really needed. But to have other family members there and people who sitting there supporting... Yeah, um, it makes a difference. It, it makes, a, it makes a, a big difference. And so I just I just felt loved on. And so I I'm, I'm, I'm moved into recovery... Uh, the recovery process was pretty painful uh, for me because they they cut out just about half of my colon. So if you know how the colon is shaped, it's like a Upside horseshoe. Down you. Yeah. It's a horseshoe that goes around your stomach and attaches to your rectum. Hey, y'all, don't judge me on this. I didn't know the difference between anus and a rectum. So for those of you who are like me, I'm going to let you. What's the difference between the anus and the rectum? No. Tell so, your story. The, so when they said that they don't, they cut half of my rectum, I'm thinking half of my booty hole is gone, and I'm like, yo, I ain't gonna be able to poop no more. <laughs> I was like, you took half of my anus, <laughs> but the anus is the actual hole of your booty. The rectum apparently is the bag that holds the feces behind the booty hole. So they removed half of my rectum, not my anus. So all that is is. Um, for those that have had a uh, weight loss surgery, um, as I understand weight loss surgery, uh, they can cut your stomach in half, sew it up, and you got half a stomach, and you can only hold so much food in there. Well, my rectum is the same way. I got half of my rectum, so that means I'm just going to go to the bathroom a little more frequently. He got baby poops. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. You know what I mean? And then after time, as I'm told, the rectum will stretch out, and it won't go back to normal size, but somewhat you know, normal. So half my rectum and my colon was taken out. So he has a straight line now. Oh yeah. yeah. So instead of now where it was a horseshoe and it connected to my rectum, I have a straight line. It goes straight to the end. And it's weird because uh, when I have to pee or if I have to pass gas or whatever, I feel all that pressure in the same spot. So sometimes the sensation for me is confusing. I don't know which one I got to do. So I'm going to the bathroom regardless. And you know, you ever go to the bathroom and fart and be like, whoo, yes. <laughs> and I sit here for 20 minutes. I don't know how long you poop, but that's how long I poop. And, you know, we go on. So, boom. All right. So, I'm in recovery. Um, after recovery, now it's time for really the real work, which is the medicine, the chemo, and all that. But before I get there, what was your experience in dealing with me from the recovery, from the physical standpoint? Um... His spirits were very high. He was very encouraged going in. It definitely helped to have um, the family members that we had there um, the whole time. Um, and folks helping, you know, like with Olivia. For him, you know, so that, that alleviated me. Because Olivia was still in school, so. Uh, I forgot to take that off. Ah, are we back? The volume, why is the volume all the way down? If y'all still there, let us know. Cause my, uh, I forgot, I got a blocker on my phone where um, it pauses because if I spend too much time on social media, it times out. So if, uh, if anybody's there, shoot us a thumb or a comment. Are we live? Did it cancel off? It just dropped in. First time I'm doing, that's why it still says live. If somebody pops back up, so now it's down to zero. If somebody uh, tune back in, more you'll see like one, two. That's weird. Oh, we're back on. Okay, 
So we're still live. One, two. All right. Thank you all. We, uh, we had, again, three. We had an um, interruption because I have a, a thing on my app, on my Facebook. If I spend too much time on social media, um, it times out my phone. So my bad, y'all. <laughs> but welcome back. I forgot what I was saying. Oh, oh, dealing with you? Yeah. Oh, he's a terrible patient, y'all. The worst. First of all, you started out with encouraging words, saying. <laughs> I said I was encouraged and stuff just because of the support and everything. You know, my child still being in school, having to go to, fro, as far as timing and everything and making sure stuff is in order. But, um, he's difficult. He really is. I don't think you guys understand. He is truly about no medication or doing it the natural way which i'm not opposed but sometimes when it comes to certain things um science is a wonderful intervention and um so doing that and then he he totally pushed himself he was supposed to be in the hospital what three, three to five days or something and overnight he we had to call well we didn't but the nurses had <laughs> made the nurses call the surgeon and come in from his grocery day or whatever he was he was doing groceries literally to come and release him and discharge him because he wasn't trying to be there um past being there overnight or whatever but um yeah i think the harder part was then coming home um but getting out the hospital was was a push listen man I'm a young guy. I'm relatively strong still, um, even though I got knee problems and back problems, but I can still carry my own weight. But after the surgery and getting in and out of the car, getting in and out of the bed, it was extremely painful. Didn't realize how much of our stomach muscles that you use to do that. And of course, that's where the main part of my, that's where the surgery was at. On top of um, the surgery, I had another issue with my back which I didn't know this could happen. And I want, to, I want to explain this to you all because in case some of you all may have surgery. As a matter of fact, Jasmine, I want to say, didn't you say you had back surgery? I, I felt like I saw a comment or but a post. if she had back surgery, she would have been laying on her stomach. So it would have been different. But any women too that have gone through labor after being so long in labor on in certain positions on your back, on your coxy area, in your sacral area, it, it causes a lot of... Um, kind of deep bruising per se um same thing with him in the position they had him in on um, the metal table hello in have the my, my behind in the air um <laughs> behind wasn't but in the position that they had him in for so many hours and already him having pre-existing i guess issues with um sensitivity in his back or whatever but um he was in a lot of pain and it wasn't because of surgery per se because they cut him up because the surgeon did a phenomenal job um and you wouldn't have even known maybe after two or three days that really he had any incisions going on but um the pain i guess was more so with him just being on the metal you know platform for six hours let me let me describe to you all, let me describe you on detail so when you go into surgery um for a colon or what do you call a colon surgery do you remember we never remove your colon or parts of your colon they put you on a metal table they put your butt in the air your your legs huh they put your they put your legs in the air they put like a, a door stopper under your butt that's what i <laughs> that's what it is right like a, a like wedge. a wedge they put a wedge so you don't slide and they put your butt right on the edge of the table um because i have a stomach what they were worried about is um, having... Like he was going into labor or something, y'all. That's exactly what I look like. So, <laughs> I'm a grown man with my legs up in the air on the metal table. And everybody looking inside my anus, you know what I'm saying, and doing surgery. And so, they do four punctures first. He had it done laparoscopically. Um, he did have it um, a bigger incision. It looks like a smiley face now on his belly. Um, where they actually took out the amount of colon that they took out they couldn't take that out laparoscopic but um it was 
very minor, I think, compared to just totally, completely opening him up and doing everything. So if he needs to take a trip, um, how far is it? What, you know, what time of day? Because the heat also affects him and things that... My father lives maybe 13 miles from here. And within that 13 mile drive, we had to stop twice so he can puke on somebody's lawn. <laughs> and then at the gas station or whatever not. Just because the motion sickness is, is unbearable. Not only um, the motion sickness, but I started getting diarrhea just all of a sudden. My stomach started cramping, driving from her dad's house down. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we got to the house... He's like a pre living with a pregnant woman. <laughs> If y'all know what it's like to live with a pregnant woman, and most of y'all, if y'all females have been pregnant, the nausea, the extreme sensitivity to scents and smells or any kind of movement, that is... Yeah. Hey, she had cooked some sausages. As a matter of fact, probably was the next day. She had cooked some... What's up, TJ? TJ. Hey, Terrence. Um, she had cooked some sausages or bacon, whatever the case, and the smell of the grease... I was completely turned off. Yeah, he can't, he's not doing well, y'all. Like, eating food, like your typical food. Not that he, he's not eating. But, typically, it's like fresh fruits um, is all really he's tolerating. Or soda, um, not soda crackers, what do you call them? Saltine crackers. We have boxes of saltine crackers because that is what his new meal is. Saltine crackers and fresh fruit. Yeah. Um, it's something, I don't know what it is about crackers, but they're very soothing. Um, they help uh, flatline the nausea a little bit. Bread helps also. I've been really inclined to eat bread and crackers. Um, I don't know, maybe it soaks up the bile. Because when I was throwing up, when I was on the chemo medicine, as I'm on the chemo medicine, I'm not throwing up food. I'm throwing up like yellow liquids, green liquids. I'm throwing up poison, essentially. So I think, I'm not a doctor, but I, what I'm thinking is that um, this stuff has helped soaking that stuff up and it's kind of limiting um, the effects of it. So um, that's it, really, with the chemo stuff. Um, what, what I would like people to understand, TJ, what's up? I got here just in time to hear you feel like a pregnant woman. <laughs> you missed his disclosure of learning what an anus and rectum are. <laughs> TJ, I didn't know the difference between my anus and the rectum, dude. <laughs> but uh, I forgot what I was saying. What you want people to know. Oh, what, what I like people to know in terms of, because you might have somebody in your family might be going through chemotherapy or dealing with cancer. Um, just a couple of, not courtesies, but just kind of be understanding. The fatigue, seriously, good to hear from you. Good to hear from you. Sir. Appreciate you, brother. Um, when it comes to being on chemotherapy, just be mindful that fatigue can set in at any given moment. It's not a gradual thing. I was literally yesterday, I was studying um, my Sunday school lesson, and I was already kind of tired. My wife went to go pick up my, our daughter, and within a minute, I was my head was on the table, and I was ready to go He's to sleep. He's like half narcoleptic too, y'all. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can fall asleep at any given moment because it's just draining. And the, Oh, so the way my chemo medicine works, and maybe that's why it'll help to understand. Both of the medicines do the same thing, essentially. They stop my cells from dividing. Of course, when a cell is divided, it's called mitosis. It's a natural process. It's something your cells are supposed to do. But what we were trying to prevent is, of course, for cancer cells to continue to multiply. So what we, so the medicine does is it inhibits, it, uh, it throws little chemical signals that, hey, stop dividing, which is why I have so much bruising and my blood is very thin because um, it's not recuperating the way it's supposed to. And then, of course, the medicine can't differentiate between what's a good cell and a bad cell. So all, all, of, all my cells are being inhibited right now. They all get the smoke. They all of them get smoked. <laughs> they all want that beef. And so the medicine, um, because of that, has caused me to be extremely fatigued because I'm not rebuilding and regenerating like a normal person. So that first infusion that I had through the IV bag, after that, that first week, I was good. I'm running around. I feel like, oh, I can do this. I just had my second fusion earlier this week, and I'm, it's taken me four days to kind of try to feel like I'm getting normal. And what I'm realizing is that each session that I go through, my body's getting broken down just a little bit more, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. It's taking me longer to recoup. It's taking me longer to recoup. And so I'm still encouraged. As you all can see, I still have full of energy. And if I don't tell you, you probably wouldn't know that I'm going through um, chemotherapy. But I think that's because of my age, because of my youth, and of course of our faith. 
Um, I believe God has always granted and, gave, and given me grace and allowed me to have an outstanding testimony after the fact. But I'm always very honest about where I'm at and it sucks. <laughs> if there was a testimony that I did not want, this is probably one of them. I, you know, you y'all know the old people where they always talk about, you know, I thank the Lord for giving me my mind and my body and health. And they always talk about their health. Well, I get it now because health, boy, it'll take, it'll take a toll on you. And definitely for me, it's been tough. Um, just the, I guess, rehashed feelings of my mom being diagnosed and then my mom didn't make it. And that was my family's sentiments and feelings that, oh man, really? We've been through this, now we're going through this again as a family? Because um, when we go through things, we, we deal with it together as a family as well. So that's been kind of hard, I think, on my side, just having to bear and do everything I possibly can, which sometimes that means doing nothing because you can't do anything in a lot of in a lot of ways, just encouraging them to, you know, or encouraging him to keep pressing forward, even when, you know, he might not want to. Um, so that's tough, and having to live a normal life by continuing to do everything else you typically would do, that's tough. Listen, y'all, just because you got cancer don't mean life stops, and I think that's the part that really sucks. Um, bills still have to be paid. Um... Our daughter still has to be still getting taken care of. Still got to cook. Still got to... Church cook. responsibilities. Yeah. Um, all Life is still happening. The world doesn't pause because, woo, I'm sick, y'all. <laughs> like, it, it, and, and that's the part that's probably most difficult for me emotionally. Um, seeing Bell pushing forward. And, and I think God does allow... Not that I think. I know God does allow certain things to happen to certain people because of the preparation of where we're going to in the future. Belle's experience in terms of dealing with cancer with her mom um, was very extreme and it was very taxing on them as a family. And it took years for them to recover after the fact. But now, based on what Belle told me, how she responded years ago to where Belle's at today, I could tell that, oh yeah, there's a difference. And she was prepared. She was prepared to deal with me and looking at the side effects. She knew all this stuff up front. Me, I'm just smiling and being a goofy broad. <laughs> do, 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 do. I can't wait to have cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm allowed that because of her support. Um, her cooking for me. Her catering to me. And um, I will, So, if there's any women... Jasmine, I know you're still on. Uh, Dr. Moore, what's going on with you? She... I just saw a post, Dr. Moore, that you're moving out to Arkansas. If I'm not correct, she was the athletic... The head athletic trainer of FSU. So... That's why. So uh, shout out to you. Um, for all the women that are watching, it pays and it helps when you are 100% uh, in. And what I mean by that, I, 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 and I think during this time I've had a pretty good attitude for the most part. There's some days that um, I could get a little moody. Pregnant female. Told y'all. <laughs> Very much. Um, having someone still support you in your hardest moments. Having, for me, let me speak for myself. Uh, let me make it personal. When I was extremely moody, when I, when I had my first vomiting spell and my diarrhea and whatnot, I was very rude to Belle. As a matter of fact, in the car, I had yelled at her because she kept asking me questions. Are you okay? Do I need to pull over? Do it. And so what she was doing was checking in with me because she can't feel the way I feel. So the only way she knows what I'm going through is literally giving me a questionnaire so that she can, she has to catalog that information for the future in terms of going through. But my personality and the way I am, uh, unfortunately, when I get irritated or if I'm in under pain, um, I don't like talking and I don't want to talk to anybody. And so I thank God that she... She dealt with me in that she was patient. It didn't. She didn't feel good. Um, me yelling at her and me being. And it's funny because I'm being impatient with her when I'm the one that's in pain, and that's kind of weird. But again, look how flesh and look how that works. Um, it wasn't fair to her, and of course, the next day I had to apologize. But 
Um, she still stood by me. She's obviously she's still here and she's still she's still working with me through these things. Even today, um, I'm not eating the way I'm supposed to because I don't have a taste for food um, the way I used to. I don't really want to eat. I just want to eat fruit and a couple of crackers. But she still is like, hey, do you want me to make you some tea? She's finding little alternatives for me to be able to eat and to be able to grow so that I'm getting a little bit of nourishment. Because she knows that if my body doesn't get these vitamins and these nutrients, I'm not where I need to be and how I need to grow up. And my body, my body literally needs every vitamin it can get for me to get to the next stage and the next step. So um, as wives, you have no idea how valuable you are emotionally to your husbands. Um, you have no idea how valuable you are physically. Um, hey. <laughs> Sex! <laughs> uh, I just cut myself off, but it just reminded me. So the doctor was like, yo, while you're under uh, chemo, you're not allowed to have sex. <laughs> no, that's not what he no, said. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say he that. He said we just couldn't have any consideration in the least bit of having any children. Because apparently... And he tried to explain this while my eight-year-old child is sitting in the office. So it's very <laughs> uncomfortable. Not for us, but for him as a doctor. Listen, man, I need to get an understanding. And he was like, so when you're dealing with a chemo patient um, and you want to be intimate with your spouse, you're supposed to wear protection because, Lord forbid, you get pregnant while under chemotherapy. As I told you all, the, what the medicine does, it stops your... And even just the exchange of any kind of fluids. Like even kissing or even um, like his spoons and forks and stuff. We have to put that in Clorox. I mean, there's nothing that kills any of that um, except for Clorox. So um, just any kind of bodily fluid um, exchange is a no-no. Thankfully, we have two bathrooms. Um, but yeah, I, we don't even use the same bathroom. They're not allowed to use our bathrooms because uh, the medicine that's going through my this the this stuff is so potent that I can't even handle it. I have to wear gloves in order for me to digest it, mm -hmm. and so they can get sick by being exposed to it. Other people can be exposed. I had one of my homies come down from Virginia, shout out to Memphis, and his kids came down, and one of the kids wanted to put my hat on. Well, I've been sweating, and so I took the hat off, and, and you know I have to explain to them. Even my sweat glands can be dangerous for them because I have, I'm essentially, um, I'm, I'm excreting poison. Yeah. Um, so my urine, my feces, my sweat, my saliva, my semen, all of that is tainted. <laughs> and so <laughs> the doctor was like, if y'all do engage, you need a barrier between her and I in, in order to do that. Because being pregnant, as I told you all, the medicine stops your cells from dividing. So... If, Lord forbid, if my cell, if my sperm was to impregnate her, um, of course you can imagine how that baby would turn out. So, if you're comfortable, Belle. Oh, um, how? Because, you know, a big thing about being married is having sex. And, uh, you know, having that closeness and that emotional, physical tie. What do you say to a wife, or maybe even a husband that has, a, or a spouse? What do you say to a spouse that is limited in that way. How do we get over? How do you continue to be motivated and um, stay connected to the spouse in that moment? And I know what I do, but I think it's more relevant for you because you're the one that have to compromise. Um, I don't know. I know God has worked a miracle on me through this process, but <laughs> um, I, I am a very intimate person and affectionate person and so that has definitely been hard that is a part of I guess my communication style with my spouse so for me I guess just embracing him and um you know giving him kisses here and there is really all that um I'm comfortable even doing because there's times where I'll touch him and it hurts like just rubbing his head and it hurts um and it's just hard, you know, um, for me at a certain point, even considering, um, being intimate, just seeing him endure, um, the things that he's enduring as well as, you know, it does put me in a depressive state, um, going through certain things. And so 
So I don't I don't feel it's been really a, a a problem. I mean, you've been very sensitive and delicate with me and all the surgeries I've gone through and things like that. And um, I, it's just it doesn't really cross my mind. I'm surprised that he would even have energy to engage in such activities. And so. I think when it comes to loving, loving Bill for me and understanding how intimate um, she is and how much uh, she create like, man, you know, as she said, that's her community, that's her love style, her love language. You know, sex is, imp is important. Yeah. Um, not that it's any less important to me, but I have been in situations where sex wasn't my priority. Uh, and I'm talking about my upbringing, my background. Um, I'm I'm a very emotional person on a different section. Like, if I'm not bringing enough money into the household in terms of taking care of my family, I lose desires quickly. If uh, if something's going wrong in my life that I haven't found resolution with, I lose my like. It's sex for, is not my driving it's force. It's very psychological for you. It's very psychological for me, and I know I that's mean, not that. <laughs> it's called human nature. <laughs> not. You know, but y'all know I got issues, so, you know, it's, it's a development. But um, I have tried to come out of myself in terms of if I have the ability to, to and, and, and I don't care if I have cancer. I still, I feel I still have a responsibility to my wife and try to appease as much as I can to the best of my ability. But her compromise is that, hey, I understand where you're at. If you don't feel like it, we good. You just get healthy. Not only that, I ain't trying to have no chemical burns. <laughs> Creating holes where there don't need to be. <laughs> First of all, don't put <laughs> Yeah, man. And I don't want to burn her neither. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to burn her. Literally burn her. Literally. Um, so, I think ultimately what I'm trying to say is that when you really love someone, and I'm talking about not just a, a, a physical, the way a person makes you feel, when you re and love to me is when you put that person's needs above your own, um, certain things stop becoming a priority because ultimately, and I can say this with confidence, she just wants me to be healthy and to be uh, better. Okay. And, that's, and that's my goal. I want to be healthy and better so that I can support my family. And so it's reciprocated. It goes back and forth. Um, I wish I wasn't as selfish well, not something I'm trying to say. I wish I was as unselfish as Bell is. And I have to tell you all this. And I'm not, this is not me just bragging and just talking because she's my wife. Uh, her family is an example to me of that unselfishness. And I think I can say this without being embarrassed or embarrassing Belle. Um, her father is someone who I admire and I look up to. Um, when I was going through my chemo, and, and, and I, I'm going to reveal this to you all. So I haven't received a paycheck since May. I haven't been working. And one of the things that Bell's dad told me uh, was that whatever I have, it's for my children in terms of supporting us and buying groceries or, and things of, of that nature. And he meant that. I know he meant that because he's, ha he's helped us in times past all throughout our marriage. Um, he's been the one to step in to, of course, do what family does. And he has never let us down in that way. He has always kept his word. He has always been a support system. As a matter of fact, he even challenges Belle to be more supportive than what she is. <laughs> and I'm not his natural son, but I couldn't tell any difference because of how much he reaches out to me. And this wasn't always the case because I didn't understand him early on when I was just dating Belle. Um, I felt like I was outside of his family circle. But what I didn't understand is that when you're in charge of a family and when you're trying to establish a family culture, um, your first priority is your family. And he's shown me that time and time and time again. So her unselfishness to me is a direct product of her upbringing and her family, which is what I'm trying to uh, implore within my own family, with my own daughter, with our own people. So it's been really dope in that way. And um, I don't know why I went in that direction, but yeah. So I don't have anything else. Do you have any last words? No. No. I mean, if anyone has any questions and stuff, I, I don't want you guys to feel like you can't address us personally. As you can see, we don't have any problems being transparent, being open. Um, I would rather you ask. It's kind of like, you know, that person in a wheelchair. Just ask instead of staring. 
you know, or, or drawing your own conclusions. Um, I would prefer that. Um, thank you to everybody, you know, um, supporting us, um, bringing us fresh fruits. Mama Fallen is um, very faithful in that. I appreciate that. Greg would not be eating if it wasn't for that. That's a fact. You know, so. Um, I mean, she's I really a sheep. Appreciate bring that. Big old bags from. Um, you know, my brother constantly checking in on us and reaching out to you, even if it's just to lift your spirits, talking about the Lakers. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, yeah, and, and you know, just, just folks, um, hey, we're here for you. I appreciate that. I really, really do. It's not easy, and no, I'm not going to always say, hey, I need your help in one way or another, or hey, I'm feeling extremely bummed today, and I just want to ball my eyes out. No, I'm not going to necessarily communicate that, but, you know, we have our moments, and I appreciate you guys for encouraging us and supporting us. She she said the majority of what I want to, uh, what's up, Billy, uh, what I want to communicate. I definitely want to say thank you to everybody who sent me um, get well cards. Uh, again, a, bit, a special thank you to Mom Fallen for um, the amount of, because really her fruit um, and what, everything that she bought was really, it was right on time. Um, the Jenkins family, I'm not going to start calling out names. If I do that, I'm going to miss somebody. But thank you, thank you to my church family uh, for being mindful and always encouraging of us. Even to, to the extent that some of my responsibilities at church um, people stepping up and wanting to relieve me and tell me, don't worry about it. I'm talking about you, Priscilla, if you're watching. <laughs> Priscilla, like, if you don't go home and rest and, and be better, um, I need to hear that. I need to be able to uh, know that everything is okay, that there are people in place that have our backs. And every message that you all have sent on Facebook, I read every single one. I try to re respond to everybody, but the, a good problem that I have is that it was so many messages that I couldn't, I like to uh, comment on each single one, but I haven't been able to do that because of so many. Um, also, just for you all, just for reference, um, this is just a continuation of the Hawk and Bell podcast that we have done. Again, it started out with just a conversation between my wife and I about certain things, current events, uh, politics, pop culture, and things like that. But it's developing more of an opportunity for us to share our stories and to give us a perspective within a relationship and within a marriage and talk about real stuff. So we won't be doing a whole lot of lives. We'll do more recordings and, you know, things of that nature and just have just genuine conversation. We hope that it helps. We help. We hope that it gives you insight and we hope that you're encouraged. But overall, um, we also want to communicate that Jesus is our strength, our hope, our love, the grace that's given to us. And through that is where we find our encouragement. New, new, golden, golden, stay. Black Do the same thing, get the same result. If you down for change, then we in the same boat. First, you gotta be the change you wanna see. And if that's you, go ahead. And hit a 1880. First off, let me start off with a question. Are you satisfied with your life? If your answer ain't 100% yeah, 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 then let the big homie get you right. right. See this mission I've been sent on, it's to encourage and I point out everything you did wrong, but help you put your sight on the light of the one who is light and in return he'll show you how to live strong. And that's real, not for play play. You, you need to be safe from your mayday. Cause if you keep going down this wrong road so long, you go nuts, no payday. See, I know this thing first, and that's why I'm telling you. Don't put your trust in things, things that keep failing you. Pause for a second, take a deep breath and tell your old ways that ain't right, they gon' get left. Do the same thing, get the same result. If you down for change, then we in the same boat. First, you gotta be the change you wanna see. And if that's you, go ahead and hit a 180. You hit a 360 and you're right back in the same place that had you feeling worthless. But divide that by two and the one tried and true I have you feeling worth it And it's fine to be nervous, nervous. Courage come with time, now you flying in your purpose Perfect. Eyes on the prize, crabs in the bucket Yelling how you saw that high Hold up, wait, 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 when you learn how to fly So if you tired of that same old saying 
and fed up with your low level living. Living, put your burdens in the hands of the king. He know what to do with her. With See, I know where you at, cause I've been where you been. At the end of your rope, and you feel you can't win. But I, but I don't focus on your problems, focus on the God that you saw. Real, do the same thing, get the same result. If you down for change, then we in the same boat. First, you gotta be the change you wanna see. And if that's you, go ahead and hit a 1180. Hit a 1-8-1-1-8-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-